I'm Dr. Fakirovari and this is Bacteremia in adults. The next learning objective is describe the common mechanisms of bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Wild type bacteria are susceptible to many antibiotics and they are called wild type because they have not developed resistance through mutations or acquisition. However, they can still be resistant to some antibiotics intrinsically and that's what determines the spectrum of activity of antibiotics. Resistant bacteria are the ones that are resistant to antibiotics that normally should have been susceptible to as wild type. For example, wild type Staphylococcus aureus is susceptible to penicillin, but you will see that many Staphylococcus aureus strains have developed resistance to penicillin. Wild type Pseudomonas aeruginosa is intrinsically resistant to penicillin. Now, when bacteria develop resistance, not only can they pass these resistance genes when they divide, but they can also pass it to other species. The transfer of resistant genes occurs generally through four different mechanisms. Transformation is when naked DNA transfers from dying bacteria to a competent recipient. Transduction is the packaging of genes, usually from small plasmids, by transducing bacteriophages. One characteristic of bacteria is that in addition to their chromosome, they also have DNA on, uh, as a circular DNA which is referred to as plasmid. And this plasmid, because it's small in general compared to chromosome, it can easily be transferred to other bacteria. In conjugation, which is the most efficient way of transferring resistant genes to other species, Self-transferable plasmids mediate direct contact by forming a mating bridge between cells. You can see in the picture in the right hand side the different steps of conjugation. Lastly, there can be conjugative transposition. You see, as opposed to chromosomes and plasmids, transposons are specialized sequences of DNA that possess their own recombination enzymes allowing transposition or hopping from one location to another, independent of the recombinant enzymes of the host. Here are the common mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. Remember, for antibiotics to work, they need to get to the site of action. This provides several opportunities for the bacteria to prevent antibiotics from getting to the site of action. The first mechanism is reduced permeability. In this picture, we're looking at gram-negative bacteria with two membranes, so there's the inner and outer membrane. And for many antibiotics to get to the site of action, they need to penetrate through the outer membrane, often by going through a porin channel. So one thing that bacteria can do is to reduce the production of these porin channels, or in some cases, even loss of porin production and that will basically eliminate the channel of entry for antibiotics. There is also something referred to as biofilm, which we will discuss when we talk about bone and joint infections. Now, if the antibiotics manage to go through the outer membrane, some organisms can actually develop efflux pump and pump these antibiotics out. This is a common mechanism in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Another mechanism is the change in antibiotic targets by mutation. So if the antibiotics do get to the site of action, then the site of action can mutate so that the antibiotic can no longer bind to the site of action. The fourth me uh, mechanism is modification of antibiotics itself. So there are beta lactamases that can actually break down antibiotics. There are also an aminoglycoside modifying enzymes that can basically alter aminoglycosides. And lastly, there is alteration of metabolic pathways. For example, the evasion of common pathway to make folic acid, which leads to resistance to trimethoferrin sulfamethoxazole. Now, there are other mechanisms of resistance, but these are the common ones that we will focus on. Now, let's compare gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So on the left, we can see gram-positive, which only has 
the, the inner mem uh, plasma membrane, there is no outer membrane. So on top of the membrane is the peptidoglycan layer. With gram negative, there are two layers. So there's the inner and outer membrane and between the two membranes, there is a small layer of peptidoglycan. Beta-lactams prevent the formation of pep uh, peptidoglycan. So their site of action is where peptidoglycan is. So in order for the bacteria to make beta-lactamase and be break down beta-lactams, they need to be made around the peptidoglycan layer. So you can see that for gram positives, so this will be actually outside of the cell, whereas for gram negatives, these beta-lactamases will be uh, basically in the periplasmic space between the two membranes. This basically shows you that with gram positives, they are likely to lose a lot of these beta-lactamases to the environment because there is nothing to hold all these beta-lactamases as they're being uh, made by the bacteria. Whereas for gram-negative organisms, because of the outer membrane, they can hold on to beta-lactamases. So this is more uh, cost efficient for gram negative. So you will see that beta lactamase production is a lot more common in gram negatives compared to gram positives. There are different ways to classify beta lactamases. The easiest one is the Ambler classification that basically classifies them as class A, B, C, and D. Now from a biochemical perspective, uh, Ambler class B is metallo beta lactamase whereas class A, C, and D have a serine moiety. Class A can be a bit confusing because it has several subclasses. So first we have penicillinases and cephalosporinases, such as TEM1 and SHEV1, and these basically break down uh, penicillins as well as first and second generation cephalosporins. These are sometimes referred to as narrow spectrum beta-lactamases. Then we have extended spectrum beta-lactamases or ESBLs. And these basically are for the most part CTXM as well as derivatives of TEM and CHEV. And the reason these are called extended spectrum is that in addition to penicillinases and cephalosporinases that break down penicillins and first and second generation cephalosporins, they also break down third generation cephalosporins as well as astrionam. Then we have carbapenemases, which basically for the most part is KPC. And what that means is that in addition to penicillinases and cephalosporinases, these also break down carbapenems. Class B, which is metallo beta lactamases are the worst in class. So they basically break down everything except astrionam. Then we have class C, which is for the most part the AMP-C enzyme, and these break down cephalosporins and penicillins, as well as imipenem, but they are stable to many uh, fourth generation cephalosporins, as well as meropenem. And lastly, we have class D, which are oxotype enzymes, and these are carbapenemases. So in addition to penicillins and cephalosporins, they also break down carbapenems. Now, over the years, we have developed many beta-lactamase inhibitors that can be bundled with beta-lactamases in order to prevent beta-lactamases from breaking down the beta-lactams. So we have clavulonic acid, which can inhibit uh, class A, including ESPL, but not carbapenemases. It can also inhibit class C, but not class B or D. Salbactam has activity against class A, but not ESBLs or carbapenemases. It is active against class C, but not class B or D. Tazobactam is active against class A as well as ESBL, but not carbapenemases, and not class B or D. It is active against class C. Avibactam, which is a broad spectrum beta lactamase inhibitor, is active against uh, all class A, including ESBL and carbapenemases. It is active against class C as well as class D, which is OXA48 type. But it is not active against class B. Weber Bactam is active against uh, all of class A and C, but not class C or but not class B or D. And really Bactam is active against all class A and C, but not class B or D. Now, in addition to their inhibition of beta lactamases. Some of them also have activity uh, on their own against some 
organisms. Now, the one that's uh, clinically important is that Salbactam itself is active against Acinetobacter. So this is something that clinically is used. So regardless of what Salbactam is uh, bundled with in the United States, it's bundled with ampicillin. So we have ampicillin Salbactam. So the Salbactam component, but not ampicillin, has direct activity against Acinetobacter and is sometimes used clinically. This is an overview of what I just discussed. Let's take a look at Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus aureus can be divided based on its pattern of resistance. So the viral type, which is basically penicillin susceptible, is constituting less than 10% of the isolates nowadays. Then we have MSSA, which is methicillin susceptible. MSSA is resistant to penicillin. Then we have methicillin resistant, so MRSA, and the drug of choice for MRSA is vancomycin. Now, while very rare in the United States, there is also vancomycin intermediate Staphylococcus aureus or VISA, and that is basically that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Staph aureus is no longer susceptible to vancomycin, but the MICs happen to be in the intermediate range. And then we have um, Staphylococcus aureus with MICs in the resistant range for vancomycin, which is referred to as VRSA. Now, MRSA is clinically important, and in general, it's, uh, there are different types of it. So we have healthcare-associated MRSA, and then we have community-associated asso MRSA. Now, there's also livestock-associated MRSA based on the antibiotics that are used in animals and in food production. Uh, you know, but clinically, we basically break these down into uh, healthcare-associated MRSA or community-associated uh, MRSA. And healthcare-associated uh, uh, is the more common strain, uh, with more, which most uh, healthcare professionals encounter. And this strain is resistant to beta-lactams, uh, with the exception of ceftaroline and uh, several other classes making prefer, prefer therapy more broad spectrum agents. Now, community acquired MRSA is strain only found in the community and other classes other than beta lactams are still uh, possibly uh, active against these. So such as like doxycycline, uh, moxifiloxacin, uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Now, something of note is that the resistance genes that make Staphylococcus aureus resistant to methicillin is the MECA gene, which can be identified on rapid diagnostics. And this is the gene responsible for alterations in penicillin binding protein 2A, and that is the target site for, uh, for methicillin class. So, nafcillin and oxacillin, uh, as well as uh, cefazolin, they bind to this site. So, when there is mutation, uh, alteration in this, they no longer can bind to penicillin binding 2A, which makes it uh, resistant to that class. Enterococcus species, which are gram positive, can develop resistance to aminoglycoside in 25 to 50% of the isolates. And these are basically plasmid mediated resistance uh, that are aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. And of course, there is vancomycin resistant enterococcus or VRE, and there are two main genes that make uh, VRE, so VAN A and VAN B, both of which can be identified with rapid diagnostic tests. And basically, the site of action for vancomycin is the dialanil dialanine, and uh, what happens in enterococcus with these genes is that basically it mutates and changes the, uh, the second alanine to a lactate, and as a result, vancomycin can no longer bind to the alanyl D lactate. Uh, and this mutation basically does not interrupt the life cycle of enterococcus. So enterococcus uh, at this point will be VRE. It continues to replicate and vancomycin will be uh, in, ineffective. Now, enterococcus is part of the human flora. So it is uh, common for people to be colonized with VRE. And that's something that can be detected uh, by screening tools on the stool sample. Lastly, let's take a look at E. coli. So E. coli is a gram-negative rod, and it can be resistant to many antibiotics, so including resistant to beta-lactams, and it's primarily through various 
uh, beta lactamase production. So including some strains can be ESBL producing, as well as KPC, which is a carbapenemase, as well as OXA48, which is a carbapenemase, and of course the whole uh, subclass of metallo beta lactamases that are carbapenemases. So though, you know, E. coli can be very resistant. At the same time, a wild type E. coli can be uh, pan sensitive to many antibiotics. Now, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole resistance is uh, basically uh, uh, increasing and it is due to overproduction of uh, dihydrofolate uh, reductase, reductase. So, dihydrofolate reductase is the site of action for trimethoprim, as well as mutations in the gene DHPS is the site of action for sulfonamide, so uh, sulfamethoxazole. Fluoroquinolone resistance can be due to polymorphisms in the uh, GIR A, which is a gyrus, the gene for the gyrus, and basically that's the site of action for fluoroquinolone, such as ciprofloxacin. Tet tetracycline resistance can be uh, due to expression of efflux pumps, which is encoded by the TET.